Thank you all for joining us today. Again, good morning. Um, I am going to get us started now. So for the next uh, 40 minutes or so to an hour, my colleagues and I will be talking about informing SBC programs using social media monitoring and listening. We will have time for Q&A at the end um, and do feel free to use the Q&A box to submit your questions at any point in time during the presentation. Um, also, please note that this webinar is being recorded and we will make the recording and the slides available to all registered participants after the webinar. So I'm very pleased to share this space today with two other colleagues. My name is Martha Silva and I am an assistant professor at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And I'm also data strategist and innovation team lead for the Breakthrough Research Project. Jonathan Walker is director of intelligence in North America for MNC Saatchi and is one of our resource partners at Breakthrough Research for his expertise in social listening methodologies. Cynthia Iracose is a program specialist at the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. And Cynthia supports the Breakthrough Action and West Africa Breakthrough Action Projects, um, which you will hear about today. In this presentation, I will start by giving you a brief introduction on Breakthrough Action and Breakthrough Research. And then Jonathan will provide an overview of why we think social media content and metrics are becoming more and more relevant to consider when looking at ways to inform and evaluate SBC programs. We have prepared this presentation assuming that many of you will not be too familiar with social listening yet, so we will provide an overview of what it is and how to do it. And then Cynthia will introduce a mass and social media campaign that young people from across Franc Francophone West Africa have been developing. Um, and implementing since 2019 with support from Breakthrough Action and their partners. And lastly, I will describe how Breakthrough Research is using social listening to generate insights and inform this campaign. Again, I really encourage you to ask questions along the way using the Q&A box, especially if this approach is new to you. For those of you who don't know us, uh, Breakthrough Action and Breakthrough Research are two independent projects implemented by two different consortia of partners, yet we work collaboratively under a single results framework to reach our intended objective, which is increasing integration of proven SBC interventions in health and development programs. We are USAID's flagship investments in social and behavior change. Breakthrough Action works in partnership with governments, civil society, and communities around the world to implement creative and sustainable SBC programming, nurture SBC champions, mainstream new techniques and technologies, and advocate strategic and sustained investment in SBC. Breakthrough Research fosters social and behavior change uh, by conducting cutting edge research and evaluation and promoting evidence-based solutions to improve health and development programs worldwide. Now I'll hand the presentation over to Jonathan to help us jump right into the topic at hand. So why should we care about data coming from social media and what is social listening and how do we do it? Jonathan? Thanks, Martha. Hi, everybody. Um, as Martha said, I'm going to walk us through what social listening as an exercise encompasses and why we use it. And before that, though, I'm just going to set the scene a little bit and try to provide some context as to how and why social listening is becoming so important. Um, and such an important part of the researcher's arsenal. Um, I'm kind of conscious as well that many of you may be unfamiliar with social listening, as Martha said, so please do feel free to submit any questions you have along the way and hopefully we'll address them at the end. And um, so moving on to the next slide, um, I guess just kind of starting from the start, it's kind of for me as a marketer and when I think of kind of the different tools we have available to us, um, I, I think of social listening as a source of insight in 2020. It's just, it's kind of easy to forget how far we've come in the last 15 years. So if you think about it, Facebook was created in 2004, uh, Twitter 2006, and the first iPhone was actually only released in 2007, so just 13 years ago. Yet what we've done in the meantime is it's quite remarkable. Um, and especially when you consider that we didn't even have the app versions of these, these um, applications until around 2013. But as I said, kind of the, the advent of social media, first through desktop and then through these smartphones, has completely changed the game in terms of understanding what specific audiences think, say, do, 
how they behave, etc. Um, and again, going on to the next slide, we see that social media use has actually been growing steadily um, over the last number of years. So in 2020, uh, there are now 3.6 billion social media users worldwide. Um, new social media platforms continue to drop. So just think of the growth of TikTok this year. It's, uh, it's kind of become the new thing. Um, before that, we had Snapchat. Before that, we had uh, you know, YouTube and Facebook, etc. Um, and I, I suppose when we're specifically looking at somewhere like Africa as well for like the purpose for this project, the big ones like Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, they all continue to be so prevalent in that market. Um, and then when you consider all these users that we have, and when we look at the next slide, we see that alongside that, smartphone usage has continued to grow. Um, and there's approximately 3.5 billion smartphone users uh, as of 2020. And this is projected to continue to grow rapidly as well. I think the crucial thing here is to understand and kind of why I'm stressing the smartphone point is that it's given us as researchers direct access um, to what people are thinking at, in the moment at the time and um, because it does allow for their spontaneous thoughts to be shared. So in many ways, the smartphone has just given us kind of direct, unlimited, unbiased access to the thoughts and attitudes of billions of people um, as opposed to talking to them after the fact it's actually getting sort of in the moment um, in the moment behavior and uh, understanding of what what they think. And so next up, um, you know, we see this alongside this kind of the increased use of a smartphone and the increased number of social media users, people are actually also spending more and more time on social platforms every day. And um, so this is a, a list of countries here, but if we look down at the bottom left, you see Kenya, for example, and in 2017, they spent approximately two hours and 50 minutes a day on social media. Um, as of 2020, that's now up to over three and a half hours. And this is something that we see across almost every country and, you know, in South Africa as well. Um, and what we're just seeing is that people are spending longer and longer on social media, which means that they're more exposed to the things that they're seeing and they're more likely to be creating content um, themselves as well. And when we look at the next slide and who actually uses social media, and we see that it is predominantly young people. I mean, it, it's, it's all generations, but young people especially it skews towards. Um, and then also most interesting, it does skew pretty heavily towards um, the low and middle income countries um, who are spending you know, more than three and a half hours per day on social media, which is higher than Europe, Asia and North America. So this just gives us, um, I guess, a lot of context as to the importance of social media and where it's going and, and that these markets are actually on it. Um, and when we go to the next slide, um, we kind of, yeah, as I said, this kind of set the scene, I think, I'd, I'd like to hope. Um, but next we look at kind of what social listening is as a practice. Um, and I guess simply put, social listening is uses an umbrella term for tools and approaches that gain insights into what people are viewing, liking, chatting, commenting about online. It kind of lets us get under the skin of what people think and, and say online. Um, but there is also an important sort of clarification between social media monitoring and social media listening. As I said, I'm, I'm quite aware that some of you might not be aware of these things. So I'm going to now just kind of try to define what each of these is. Uh, so on the next slide, we see social media monitoring. Um, and sort of simply put, this is basically used to track a campaign or brand performance uh, using the quantitative metrics that we have. And um, so this would answer questions such as, you know, what is the awareness and level of engagement uh, with a campaign on social media platforms? So this might be if you, have a, if you have a campaign and you have a dedicated hashtag associated with that, social media monitoring will kind of get under the skin of, you know, what the engagement with that hashtag is and um, who's liking it, who's sharing it, et cetera. Uh, we can also look at the volume of conversation related to a key topic um, and we can look at the sentiment of those conversations um, related to that campaign or that brand or that topic. And um, so social media monitoring, just to kind of underline it, is essentially the quantitative measurement of a campaign or a conversation. Whereas social media listening is, uh, if we just, yeah, social media listening is essentially what allows us to qualitatively understand um, a brand or a campaign or a hashtag or a, a topic. Uh, so this will allow us to kind of get under the skin of who is messaging about topics and topics of interest and, and what they're specifically saying. It allows us to understand where these comments are coming from. Um, it allows us to understand, as it says there, the unbiased attitudes and behaviours of an audience on a specific topic. So if, as in this case, it's people talking about sexual behaviour or family planning, it allows us to kind of see what their in the moment responses are to certain things happening around the world, um, or even just their attitudes towards a certain topic and what they're thinking on that. Um, social listening also allows us to understand what misinformation might exist. So particularly in this analysis as well, or th this example, we've seen posts of people kind of talking about their family planning behaviors and we understand that there might be 
kind of misinformation um, permeating throughout social media. Uh, so this allows us to kind of try and tackle that head on. Um, and then also finally, it allows us to understand what insights can be learned about underlying attitudes and social norms. So kind of a, a recap of what I've said above. But I think an important thing here just for everyone to think about is how can you, or how could you possibly leverage, leverage this sort of data to redirect, redirect your SBC programs. Um, but just to go to the next page, I think what kind of sums up social listening again in a, just a quite nice way is from a quote from Gofar F. Khan, who's the author of Seven Layers of Social Media. And he simply says that social media listening is the art and science of extracting valuable hidden insights from vast amounts of semi-structured and unstructured social media data to enable informed and insightful decision making. So if you think about social media kind of as being sort of the wild west of anybody can say anything online, what social listening is doing using tools and, and um, you know, processes is going out and gathering all of that data together, um, you know, whether it be likes, comments, just posts that you're putting up yourself. It's getting a handle on all of that. It's structuring it into sort of, um, you know, designated buckets based on what's being said or what the keywords are within the comments. Uh, and then it's basically finding insights from that. And then from those insights, we can then actually start making informed decisions about how people think and act and what they say. Um, so when we move on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to put this up to kind of understand where social listening fits in alongside traditional research. Because as I said, I'm conscious that some of you aren't, or are probably quite heavy traditional research uh, focus. So I want to understand how these processes can complement each other. And as I mentioned before, the smartphone has kind of given us this view of unfiltered, freely volunteered thoughts and opinions of their audience. So just when you're comparing it to something like a focus group, um, social media analysis basically extracts consumer insights from unsolicited conversations. Um, so they're not being asked what their opinion is on something. It's purely what they are freely admitting or freely putting out there. Um, so in many ways, social media data, particularly from a marketer background, is argued to be one of the most passive data sources. Uh, that we have to hand. It's likened to a series of unstructured qualitative exercises and often with a relatively large sample size as well, depending on the market that you're looking at. So the great benefit of social data is definitely the ability to turn back time and capture responses in the moment, rather than asking respondents to post-rationalize what their thoughts or opinions may have been. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'll just reiterate the point that the purpose of this isn't to say that one is better than the other. It's more just to say that they actually, they do have a place side by side and that they can really complement each other. And um, so moving on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time kind of, you know, explaining what social listening, or sorry, I have explained social listening now, but I want to spend a bit of time just saying how we kind of go about conducting these exercises. Um, and of course, if there are questions at the end, we can follow up in more detail. Um, but yeah, so over the course of 2004 to 2010, uh, as I kind of explained, we had all these social media sites kind of emerging and people spending more and more time on them, commenting on them. And I guess during this period, 04 to 10, we kind of had no idea what to do with all this data. Uh, all this unstructured data was suddenly here. There were likes, shares, tweets, comments, and it was just all out there. But then slowly around sort of 2010, over the last decade, um, you've seen a bunch of players um, kind of emerge and understand that there's a huge opportunity here to, to take from this data and to extract value from it. And um, so, you know, there's some social listening companies listed there, but what they essentially do is they either purchase or else through their own proprietary crawlers, they will aggregate social data and um, looking at public facing social posts. Um, and yeah, we've basically, we've seen an explosion of these companies emerge. Uh, there are a whole host of them. I'm not going to go into what all they are, all of them are. Um, but on the next slide, I'm just going to take you through some of the leading players. Um, so first of all, um, I have identified Brandwatch, Synthesio, Sysmos, and Crimson Hexagon as the leading players. Crimson Hexagon have actually just merged with Brandwatch as well. So there's now sort of three main players, but of course there are others as well. Um, they're all right, widely regarded as the three best in the business. Um, they allow you to search for a combination of keywords, you know, be it a simple hashtag, it might be one hashtag that you're looking for any mention of, or it could be a whole host of words um, around a topic that you're researching. Uh, so you input all of those words and look for any comments that have a combination of those words. Um, they all have kind of strong visualizations, so they might have, say, a topic wheel or a word cloud or something to help you get under the skin of what's being said. Um, and they all also offer a, a whole bunch of uh, different sort of variations of their product. So it might just be a simple monitor going in to look for a mention of a word, or it might be tracking a, a, a specific campaign, or it might be 
what they're all kind of focusing on now is machine learning um, and kind of understanding when you put in a, a topic, the machine will go off and understand, you know, it will get better at reading the comments and returning the ones that are most relevant to you based on how you train it. And that's kind of the, the big play now for most of these players. And um, just as a, as an aside, uh, Forrester, the, the, tech consultant they produce an annual report looking at the leading social listening platforms and what they've in their most recent report in 2020 they essentially said that each of these players emphasize the unique applicability but that each vendor is essentially the same uh, they're offering more or less the same things and uh, they all have identical products and they're all trying to improve machine machine learning cap capabilities at the next big play and um, but in terms of cost uh, they're all roughly similar. Some, they, some of them do have free products. Some of them uh, kind of get a bit higher up. So Sysmos has an entry level of $500 a month. Uh, Brand Watch is a little bit more expensive at $2,000 a month. And really just depends on what, what you're looking for from your campaign, uh, what the, the need and depth of, um, you know, the, the depth of resource that you want to go to with it. Uh, I personally use Brand Watch just because that's what Embassy Sachi, um, uh, that's just a partner of ours. But they're all, as I said, more or less the same. So just if you're looking at social listening as kind of, you know, this might be an interesting thing for you to get into. There are also some free players on the next slide. And um, so some of the freebies that I've kind of come across in my time, and I will kind of stress that because I do have access to Brandwatch, I don't use these all that much. Um, but there are freebies that I've recommended to, to friends and other colleagues in other agencies. Um, and they are Social Mention, Twasup and Quintly. Uh, they're all roughly similar. The, the slide shows a screenshot of a social mention um, search, but essentially what they do is they work in a very similar way to the likes of Brandwatch and Sysmos. You put in a word that you want to track and see mentions of, um, and then depending on that, it will return what it finds. Social mention is probably the most kind of um, sophisticated of them. So that's why I've uh, included that on this slide, but basically it's a media search analysis platform and it will look at, it'll get all the user generated content into a single stream. The problem with the freebies is that, you know, they don't have as good data coverage as some of the, the bigger players. So while you might be pulling in a bunch of tweets, you can't ever be sure that it is necessarily all the tweets that exist. Um, and then also obviously they will try and upsell and, and move you up the chain as well. So in terms of actually conducting a social listening exercise and kind of the methodology behind it, the next slide outlines some of the key steps in that. And um, so kind of step number one, whenever you're approaching a social listening product is, or project is to understand what conversation terms um, you are looking out for and, and to construct your Boolean search string. So a Boolean search string is essentially just a type of string that allows you to combine words uh, or keywords with near operators such as and, and not, or or. So you're looking for a mention of say, hotel and NYC, and that would return a tweet that mentions both hotel and NYC, whereas if you said hotel or NYC, that returns any tweet that mentions either. I'll explain this in a little bit more detail on the following slide. Um, but then next up, it's also important to determine the study period. So are you looking to track something ongoing from this point in time? In which case you would say, okay, I've got a campaign launching tomorrow. I'm gonna to track how effective that is over the next two months. Or are you looking to try and understand attitudes and behaviors from you know, a year ago so that you can then inform how you go about launching this campaign? And that would just be a case of setting your dates and saying, okay, I'm looking at 2019 data. Uh, I want to understand that. Uh, other considerations that you might have are what social media sources you want to monitor. Uh, and there are some complications here in that Facebook and Instagram are typically very difficult to get data on ever since the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, so essentially, if you're setting up a campaign and you want to monitor a hashtag, you can do that and you can follow that on Instagram, but you can only do it uh, kind of forward facing. So you can only set it up and then track from then. You can't necessarily look retrospectively, whereas something like Twitter, YouTube, uh, any blogs, news sites that have sort of social, um, social presence, all of those can be done retrospectively. So again, it's just about what the aim of the, go of the product project is and how you want to go about doing it. And then essentially, once you've done all of this stuff, that's when you would then work with the programs that I've outlined before, uh, the likes of Brandwatch, uh, to input your Boolean search string, understand what data is coming back, and then try and train the machine to kind of recognize what is important, what is what we call noise, which is basically irrelevant volume, um, and yeah, train the machine to, to get that right. And then we can start digging into what the volume of posts are, what the sentiment is, where people are engaging with it and why. So when we actually put this into practice, um, I mentioned before the Boolean search string, and we go on to the next slide, um, you'll see kind of 
the thought process of this. So for this particular project, we were looking at family planning, uh, looking at sort of attitudes towards sexual behavior and, and safe sexual habits. So when you're thinking of that, immediately you might think, okay, some of the key words that I want to think of are sex, contraceptives, condoms, pregnant. And you start kind of thinking about that, those are the kind of obvious ones. Then you start thinking, okay, but also there's some local nuance to this market. So maybe I need to understand what sort of terms people might be saying in their local vernacular. So you see, so we reached out to some local partners in Francophone Africa and saw words like skin to skin essentially means unprotected sex or bareback or smash or knack. Uh, all these kind of local nuance words we may not have understood before. So we might add those into the Brilliant String. On top of that, as you dig deeper, you might then think, okay, well, what are the consequences of unprotected sex? There's STDs, it's HIV, uh, there's the fact that you need to get tested or know your status. So kind of as you, as you see, as you dig deeper and deeper into it and into the topic, there's more and more words coming out, which is where Boolean search strings are so important to really make sure that you are getting the most sort of accurate and relevant material coming back. And then adding on on top of that, sorry, there's additional words, so maybe something around sexual violence or the issue of consent or who it might be with, whether it's with your husband or your sexual partners. So this just helps you kind of understand the, the many layers that go into formulating a Boolean search string, which I think is why it's probably the most important part of any social listening project to make sure that you get this right from the start. Um, and then just to the next slide to kind of show you how this might go about building. So I mentioned before um, about the near word operators and the conjoining words. So for example, this one on screen, this would get you any mention or any tweet that mentions sex and condoms together, um, which all well and good, or else you could change that for or and it would get you any mention of sex or condoms. When we add in uh, these brackets, and a near word operator of 10, what this is essentially doing is looking for mentions of sex and condom within 10 words of each other, which I think is really important because, you know, otherwise you might get a blog post that, you know, in sentence one mentions sex and four pages later mentions condom and they're not really linked at all. Whereas with a near word operator, it just allows you to really hone in and make sure that what results you are pulling back are as relevant as possible. So on the next slide, I'm just going to show you a kind of a a snapshot of one of our search strings for a project that we've done this year and this isn't meant to intimidate you or make it daunting in any way but it's just to show you kind of the level of detail that does go into these um, and obviously this is just a snapshot of one it's looking at one particular subtopic of the overall topic um, and also when you consider we're doing this in different markets we might have different languages etc what this allows you to understand is that we're looking for things like condom sex raw sex um, had sex etc but then in combination with words like had have I am just to try and make them more and more relevant and to make sure that what we are pulling back is the, the most applicable thing and um, so at that point I think I'm now going to hand you over um, but as I said by all means do ask any questions that you might have and I've seen some of them coming in as well so I'm excited to look at those. Thank you Jonathan. Um, now are we now we are moving on to the first application of social media monitoring and listening that I will present to you. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge the whole team, the consultants and Breakthrough Action Project staff that work on this uh, campaign. Breakthrough Research is conducting an evaluation and, of social media and mass media campaign for Merci Mon Hero, which means thank you my hero in French. This campaign is led by our partner Breakthrough Action and is currently being implemented in um, all Ouagadougou partnership countries plus the Democratic Republic of Congo. As you can see on the left, this is the original campaign logo and to the right we have the campaign tagline that encourages youth allies to talk to young people and also we have um, our hashtags Break the Taboos and Be a Hero. Next. The initial idea of the Merci Mon Hero campaign uh, was sparked by a contest at the Francophone SPCC Summit in February 2019. Um, it challenged teams of youth and youth allies to design a regional campaign to improve young people's image across the region and allow them to have more of a say in reproductive health and decision making. From this context came Merci Mon Hero which is a collection of oral stories celebrating the difference youth allies can make in youth's reproductive lives. In the summer of um, that same year, uh, Breakthrough Action brought together a group of young people from across Francophone West Africa to build their capacity to produce and share their stories. An initial wave of five videos were produced and our target population were young people 
uh, from older adolescents to young adults, as well as influential adults who are in the position to be youth allies. Merci Monero launched its first uh, videos online in November 2019 uh, via um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And after that, the campaign was broadcast and promoted on TV, radio, community-based activities, um, such as public screenings, discussions, flash dances, etc. In its um, and that that were that was in um, the four countries and sub subsequently in an addition of five francophone countries. The video was covered topics uh, included first periods, first sex, first pregnancies, first relationships, and family planning method use. Uh, heroes include mothers, teachers, sisters, aunts, uncles, friends, and partners. Next. As you might infer from the logo and tagline, uh, the campaign objectives are to encourage young people to talk about their real realities around reproductive health and family planning. Uh, you also encourage uh, adults to overcome restrictive social and gender norms. Also, uh, stipulate, it stimulates discussions between the youth and adults uh, to ident identify the, these restrictive social and gender norms um, to, and to address them, shift these norms and remove the shame and taboos that prevent young people from accessing reproductive health and family planning information and services. Next, okay. Since the launch of our campaign in November last year, we've built quite an online following, uh, leveraging the MMH regional consultants, existing networks, promoting our social media page, uh, pages at in-person and mass media events, and also through our online influencers. Our most active platform has been Facebook, as you can see on the slide, um, where we now have, uh, I checked this morning, it was 29,000 followers, um, with a potential reach of over 1 million. You can see here also an overview of the types of content, content that we post to each platform and who we see as our priority audience for each. Uh, next, okay, good. Aside from promoting upcoming uh, video releases and our Facebook live sessions, we also promote our mass media and in-person activities in multiple MMH uh, countries. We share the dates and times when MMH teams we appear on local TV and radio stations. We share um, we shared videos of some of the team's activities at the recent Ouagadougou Partnership annual meeting. And currently we are sharing details of our community activities on the way in many of our four, four um, focal countries. After events, we share photos and videos um, and we are working on trimming our TV radio segments to highlight reels. When possible, we also make an effort to link our community activities with the videos we launched online that week or month and discuss the themes that come up um, in those testimonial, testimonials in person. We also work with social media influencers to share some of our content to and to extend um, the campaign's reach and help build its following. I will now pass it on to Marta. Thank you, Cynthia. So um, now I'm going to talk about the um, the evaluation um, component. So as part of the evaluation that Breakthrough Research is conducting of the Merci Monero campaign, uh, we are using social listening in the following ways. So we want to understand what attitudes towards sexual behavior and family planning were observable in online conversations prior to the launch of the campaign. We also wanted to understand the level of engagement that the campaign has on social media, as well as provide programmatically useful feedback for possible mid-course correction to Breakthrough Action so that they could act on this information. 
Thirdly, we want to investigate to what extent there is an observable effect of the campaign on key conversations one year after the launch of the campaign. So we want to try to see through social listening, um, is, is there any discernible shift in online conversation in these, um, in these countries? So here's a snapshot of the timeline. Um, above the timeline, you see the campaign development and implementation, and below the timeline, um, you see the social listening and evaluation activities. So the social listening baseline, again, just to reiterate, analyzed online posts from a full year prior to the launch of the campaign. And then the monitoring reports have been periodically produced during the implementation of the campaign to provide kind of a quick turnaround, quick feedback. And then the social listening end line report will be produced about a year after the start of implementation. So we will um, also conduct uh, another qualitative evaluation using the most significant change methodology in the period, um, hopefully uh, from October to December of this year, um, to complement uh, the, the social listening method as well. So now I'm going to talk us through a few of the select findings from the baseline report. So first off, uh, we wanted to understand where is the conversation coming from in terms of countries, but also in terms of channels. We very quickly realized that there was a tremendous difference in the use of social media between the four countries. And I, 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 I want to just mention that the four uh, focus countries here are Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Burkina Faso, and Niger. So there is a tremendous difference. As you can see, 78% of the data came from Cote d'Ivoire followed by Togo, Burkina Faso, and, um, and Niger. And Niger, as you can see, only contributes about 3% of the data. So we, of course, um, then realized we, we, we analyze each country separately. Also, the vast majority of the conversation analyzed comes from Twitter, followed by news outlets, Facebook, and others. And this is important to note um, because as Johnny mentioned, since the Cambridge Analytica scandal, there are important privacy related restrictions that inhibit the use of certain platforms and Facebook and Instagram are among those. So this is a screenshot of what you can consider your raw data. Um, so this is a Twitter thread, as you can see, of a person talking about a conversation they've just had with their 15 year old son and they're talking about finding out that their son is already sexually active, um, a lot of use of emojis, so a lot of emotions there, um, that they find out that they've been having sex without a condom, they talk about STI testing, about pregnancy, about rape, and um, this person is also ultimately encouraging other parents to talk to their young people about these topics. And so um, this, just to re reiterate, this is your raw data that you're, you're dealing with. When we take all these tweets and other posts at scale, we have several ways of looking at the data to help us visual, visualize what are the emerging themes. This here is a biogram analysis, which measures how often words occur next to each other in text. And this is really useful, I think. It's a very useful tool because it allows you to pick up emerging themes. And this particular image comes from the Cote d'Ivoire data. In these clusters of words, we can see, for example, there's a theme A that's coming out with the word hate, eating, the skin of a banana. So it's a, a, a theme around hate, hating protected sex. Um, in a cluster B, we see a conversation around menstrual hygiene, um, period pain that um, was very resonant in, this, in this, these audiences. Cluster F shows uh, the word sex as a central topic, and then it has a link with thorny issues around clarification of consent. And then moving on to this cluster G, we get into the use of condoms. So again, this is just to show you one of the ways that you can start to pick up emerging themes um, and visualize uh, these themes. So we continue the thematic analysis under these main reproductive health themes. So just to quickly name some of these findings. Under sexual behavior and contraception, we found across the countries um, evidence of the persistent belief that women are responsible for most, if not all, pregnancies and that avoiding a pregnancy is a woman's responsibility. We also saw um, embarrassment as an overriding concern when buying condoms. 
Under the theme of gender inequity or equity, we see emerging women's voices trying to normalize the idea that women should have the right to make the same choices as men do about their sexuality um, without fear of being ashamed. Under menstruation, as we've mentioned, it, um, we did see very variable levels of knowledge about menstruation and anything related to menstruation. So that's certainly been one of the biggest, uh, I think, themes across the MMH campaign. And under STIs, we do see continued fear and misinformation about HIV testing. So here, I just wanted to show you quickly what we can learn about the tone of the conversation. A uh, sentiment is measured by analyzing keywords and determining the overall positivity or negativity featured in a post. And it does not explicitly mean that a post is positive or negative, uh, or, or a, a positive or negative reaction towards content, but it reflects the tone of the keywords used in a post. And we see that Niger's conversation shows mostly a positive sentiment, while Cote d'Ivoire has the lowest level of positive sentiment. But when we were digging a little bit deeper into why this could be, we realized that these differences were largely attributable to a greater proportion of conversations being made up of family planning or advocacy or health organizations in, in Niger, whereas in Cote d'Ivoire, um, we had a significantly higher proportion of organic posts which tend to have a more uh, negative sentiment by nature. So moving on to um, what we can learn from the monitoring reports, um, I just want to remind you that social media monitoring can provide you with the metrics around the reach and level of engagement with the campaign. So what you can see in this graph is the total number of times people engaged with campaign posts through reactions, comments, shares, retweets, mentions, and likes. So between November 1st, 2019 and June 10th, 2020, there has been 24,023 organic engagements across social media channels directly related to this campaign content. This includes uh, shares, retweets, mentions, um, and Facebook uh, comments, responses to videos, etc. In total, more than 1.7 million people have been reached through the content posted on the Facebook page. Um, and in this context, reached is defined as having had campaign content enter your screen. We can also see that content that garnered the highest level of engagement is the Facebook Live uh, video. So what you can see is the highest peak. That was a Facebook Live video posted um, in June and the topic was around female puberty. And there, was also, there have also been Facebook Live events around male puberty but seem to not be quite as popular. So we wanted to help break through action to answer the question, is um, the content reaching the intended audiences online? And this is one of the things that social listening can do for us and social monitoring. Analyzing those who have liked the Facebook page, we can see that the audience skews heavily male and age-wise the 18 to 24 and 25 to 30 year, 34 year old uh, groups continue to make up the greatest proportion of the MMH Facebook audience and together they, they, they sum up to about 74%. So the content that is produced is likely to be seen by predominantly younger and predominantly male audiences. So um, the older youth allies, the, the older audiences um, that represent the other primary target group is likely not being reached through these channels at least. Another question that we pose ourselves comes from studying the video completion metrics that Facebook provides. So Facebook tells you how long people engage with the video content. And this graph shows that the proportion of viewers that view less than three seconds and less than 30 seconds um, uh, is, is quite large. So most of the viewers are social media browsing, which means they're just scrolling through, through their Facebook feed and not necessarily stopping to see uh, a, a large proportion of the content. So, um, so feeding this information back to Breakthrough Action um, can also let us think about, you know, what are ways that you can engage people so that they stop and, and look at your videos. The last three columns that you see are videos that have been posted more, more recently, um, and we do see that the proportion of, uh, of views that have watched uh, you know, more than 95% of the content is significantly greater. So we'll hopefully um, see an improvement there. 
Um, so Cynthia is now going to tell us how the MMH campaign has used the social listening insights so far. Cynthia? Thanks, Marla. So the Merci Monero campaign has benefited greatly from the social listening reports. And so much so that Breakthrough Action plans to continue this activity in the coming year. Um, the, the baseline report came after we had already filmed our first wave of videos. It helped us validate that certain themes uh, that we've covered in this first series, such as first and painful periods, were topics of interest. And um, accordingly, this became a topic we explored far further during multiple Facebook Live sessions with a midwife, um, for instance, female puberty, regular and irregular cycles, a cycles linked to fertility, and why both sexes um, should understand menstrual cycles. And as I, I mentioned um, earlier, it also helped orient the campaign to other themes of interest, uh, including gender roles, couple communication, and unplanned, unplanned pregnancy. We are hoping that this and working with female uh, influencers will help us increase our female audience. The reports also helped us make specific changes to our campaign uh, materials, specifically shortening our intro, uh, introduction, and um, the overall video length from about uh, four minutes to about uh, two and a half minutes. We are also adding another video format for the next wave where key messages will sometimes be shared upfront rather than at the end of the video. And now we post um, teasers uh, to build interest before the video itself is posted. Uh, we also made changes to our social media strategies. Um, we now post more consistently on Facebook, continue our Facebook lives, and we add more visual content. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how to have more norms focused discussions versus consistent event promos. Over to Marta. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and, and finally, we are looking more closely at non-social media platforms to more eff effectively reach our older ally allies and uh, adult audiences. Uh, for instance, in the coming year, we are looking more closely at print media, online news sites, smaller group community conversations, and perhaps putting new energy into our Twitter strategy. And we're also looking at Instagram. Um, yeah, we also be unveiling a new campaign logo that may appeal more to allies and adults. Keep an eye on that. Over to Marta. Thank you, Cynthia. So I am quite conscious of time. And so I'm going to skip over these next steps since I've already mentioned them. And I'm going to uh, go straight into the limitations. Uh, some of these limitations may, may help um, answer some of the questions that I'm seeing coming in. So I th obviously think it's always important to talk about the limitations, um, especially with we when we have these new tools that are very exciting. So firstly, sampling related biases. So of course you have to think about for any given context, any given country, who is using social media. Um, just as I've shown you um, the vast differences that exist between Cote d'Ivoire and Niger in terms of the volume of online conversation and engagement, um, we know that social media users tend to skew younger and they tend to skew male. So this can vary a bit by social media platform, but I think it tends to hold true across the board. So being very conscious of, of who is participating in this conversation. Second, um, topic resources. The analysis tools that, that Jonathan has mentioned, they can scrape data from public facing social media platforms. Um, including, you know, mostly t uh, Twitter, YouTube, everything that you see here. We have mentioned this limitation of using Facebook um, and Instagram, especially since the Cambridge Analytica um, scandal. In the case of Merci Monero, we were able to analyze Facebook data by gaining administrative access to the MMH campaign page. Um, but you have to be aware of this particular limitation when you use Facebook page. So retrospectively, before the campaign, we weren't able to, um, to, to get a hold of a lot of Facebook data, um, but for the monitoring uh, report purposes, we were. Next, 
the machine uh, learning process involved in identifying relevant conversation and also in analyzing topic sentiment is get be getting better and better. Um, maybe not by the day, but certainly very quickly, but it cannot be considered complete or exhaustive. So there may be um, parts of the conversation that you're missing um, because, uh, you know, as, as kind of this machine learning process evolves. Fifth, um, to what extent do we know if people are more likely or less likely to be subject to social uh, desirability biases? And I think I saw a question come in related to that. And I, I, I personally, um, you know, I'm not sure. Are people more honest and open online than they would be face to it's face to face with another person, as Jonathan was mentioning, because they're capturing either tweets or comments or opinions in the moment um, about something that's happening that's relevant or are uh, people more likely to pose in some way in social media um, apologies for the ambulance uh, noise so I, for me this is something that is still um, a little bit um, unresolved uh, and i'm happy to engage in a debate in that Lastly, the, I think, at least in my opinion as well, the jury is still out from our point of view as to how sensitive a tool social listening and analysis can be to detect changes in conversation that can be linked to a particular campaign. So we're really looking forward to learning through this upcoming N-line analysis and documenting lessons learned from, uh, from this process about how to use social listening in evaluations. So just to finish, I wanted to provide you with a, a preview of what, what some of those lessons learned have been. Um, so firstly, as I've mentioned, you have to consider whether to invest in social media um, platforms or outsourcing. And Jonathan mentioned some of the options out there. We personally decided to partner with MNC Saatchi Intelligence. And the great strength that this partnership brought is that they, unlike other marketing firms that we um, talk to, they have experience working in the global public health arena. Um, and so not approaching social listening uh, from that marketing angle, which uh, uh, is not always kind of super in line with the public health or development field. Um, and so as we're really kind of wanting to explore the outer limits of what we can do with social listening, especially for campaign evaluation purposes, um, we're really glad to have this partnership um, with MC Saatchi. So next, as I just alluded to as well, um, you, we need to think about who uses social media in your country of interest and what is the volume of online conversation. Um, and so when considering is this a, a useful tool or not in, in the context, um, you, you might have to think about the audience. So who are you interested in, in learning more from and who is participating in this online conversation? Um, again, you know, as, I, as I've mentioned, I, we see now that social listening is probably a better tool to use in Cote d'Ivoire than it is in Niger although it has definitely been illuminating to compare the outputs by country. Um, another element to consider in all of this um, is the most relevant social media platforms in your country of interest. Um, as I said, for our baseline study, um, clearly in all four countries, the most used platform is Facebook, yet we could not access Facebook data due to the limitations that I've already mentioned. Um, Thankfully, through the, the partnership with Breakthrough Action and uh, gaining administrative access to their page, we were able to incorporate that um, for the, the monitoring piece. Um, next, um, recommendations from the social listening experts. Use pronouns to refine your search and you can get a much cleaner data set. And lastly, um, as you would using other research methods, you should enter the project without preconceived notions of what you will find. So I think this brings us to the end and I know we have a lot of questions. Um, I wanna just thank you for your attention and we can probably start answering some of these questions. Great, um, I think I might jump in because I think quite a lot of the questions are directed towards the center of the my expertise and um, so a couple of that I've just pulled out and if I miss any I, I'll definitely follow up afterwards and we can we can sort that out 
Um, but okay, so we had one. Do you find that accounts that you end up listening to on social are more like media outlets, influencers, other organizations, or business pages rather than private citizens? Um, and I think this really, it, it kind of really stressed the point that it really comes down to what market you're looking at. Uh, so, for example, in the Ivory Coast one, we definitely we did have a lot of uh, comments from media outlets and influencers, but we also had a lot of organic conversation. So we could really get under the skin of that and understand what people were saying and doing. Whereas in a market like Niger or Burkina Faso, maybe it was a little bit more limited. So I think that's just something you have to consider up front and, um, you know, assess what market you're looking at and understand what it might be. And it's, it's always worth just doing a sort of a preliminary search and seeing what kinds of comments are coming back because that will kind of give you a, a sample of what you might expect from a broader and um, broader one and um, do you find that data can be skewed due to the audience of the primary data source eg if twitter has a higher penetration of men and you wish to listen to young women and how do you address this to ensure that listening is accurately reflecting um, the, the thoughts of your target population and again, that's something that we've kind of touched on a little bit and the caveat that most of these markets do skew quite heavily male. Um, and again, it, it will come back to what market you're looking at, but these social listening tools do allow you to filter by gender. So if the particular project that you were doing specifically wanted to look at women, we could filter to look for comments coming just from women and that would be okay. But again, the caveat there is just that a lot of these markets are heavily skewed male. So it just, whether the sample size is robust enough. Um, and just sorry, on that point as well, the question references young women. The one, uh, one of the barriers of social listening or limitations is that you can't actually define by age. Um, in your search, you can see the age breakdown of a topic and people talking about it, but you can't set it as a parameter to look specifically for comments from, say, women aged 18 to 24. Um, but what you can do is set up the search to look just for comments from women and then looking at the comments that come back, you can try and uh, understand it based on sort of the types of things they're talking about um, and what their profile might suggest. Um, interesting point that organic posts in this topic are by nature more negative in sentiment. Um, wonder if trying to seed positive conversations on social media would help. Um, and I guess, yeah, this is just a, again a point around sort of the machine learning algorithm and how much better that's getting. Um, and you know, a, a project is only going to be as as well as that machine is trained. And um, so, if with, with the reason that why it quite often skews negative in sentiment is because a lot of the words that we're looking at here, like say maybe um, you know, it might be sexual violence or rape or some of these kind of heavier words, they have negative connotations attached to them already. So, if you don't train the machine, it's going to automatically assume that those are all in a negative context, and it will therefore skew negative. Once you have trained the machine to recognize certain nuance in words and in sentiment, then you'll get a better visualization and representation of what the sentiment actually is. But this is definitely a consideration to bear in mind. Um, we have a question around misinformation and how are organizations addressing this? Uh, who are the actors? What are the challenges? And I think, yeah, this is a really important one because, you know, it's, it's a problem all over the world right now through social media and just media in general. Uh, the idea that there is so much misinformation and it's such a thorny subject that, you know, it's quite difficult to get a handle on. I think that in all of these markets and in this analysis, what we've seen is a lot of NGOs and advocacy groups constantly putting out posts that try to tackle this misinformation. And that is obviously really important. And um, I think also in a campaign like Mercy Monero is so important because it is actually kind of youth led and it's people trying to spread awareness about topics and trying to spread awareness about um, information that is correct. So as these kind of things grow and uh, become bigger and have more reach, that will obviously be important in tackling this misinformation. But I think that, you know, it, you can't look past the fact that the challenges are huge and that, um, you know, even the likes of YouTube and Facebook have now introduced their censoring of topics and they, you know, they, they try to identify misinformation and flag it and tell you. But even this, you know, as you would have seen through pushback to this, you know, it's considered a, a breach of freedom of speech or it's, you know, people think it's censorship and you know it definitely is a thorny subject that I don't necessarily know the answer to and um, but it's just something that we have to bear in mind as we go forward through any of these analyses. Can, uh, I, can I just jump in here um, can you talk a little bit about so just to 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 pick a, um, a couple of other themes to disaggregate sentiment around um, how uh, to what extent can you disaggregate sentiment? Sure uh, and I mean I've kind of I've discussed that a little bit in terms of how you go about finding the sentiment through the keywords and everything. Um, but yeah, within, within any analysis, um, 
you know, if it's a broad topic, like say family planning, we can then segment the conversation down to the individual sort of subtopics within that. And then we can look at what the sentiment is around each individual subtopic. So again, it's, it's all done through analyzing the language, uh, understanding what keywords are being used and in what sort of, um, you know, in what tone. Uh, but we could definitely see sort of what the sentiment around a certain subtopic is and then compare it to another one. So say it's, it's menstrual hygiene versus uh, use of contraception and we can understand what the sentiment is. And then once we've done that, you can then say, okay, well, you know, menstrual hygiene had a 20% negative sentiment reading and you can dig into why that is. So we can start looking at all the comments that have been tagged as negative um, and start to kind of build a picture as to why that negativity is coming across. And is it that people are just scared to talk about it? Is it that, you know, it's schools not being set up properly to uh, facilitate young women and young women then having to miss school as a result. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of different ways that you can look into it, but um, really it does all come back to how well you train the machine and how well you kind of recognize the keywords that are being used. Um, were there any other, Martha, that you thought were particularly good ones, or should I just continue through some of the other ones that I have here? Sure, keep going. It seems like um, yeah, I'm, it's I'm having a, a bit of a time trying to categorize these into different... Um, yeah, I, I know that one has come up a lot, and I think you did actually answer it since it came up first, Martha, but one is just talking around the social media sources, um, and which ones can you get? Uh, one that many people asked about was WhatsApp. And unfortunately, WhatsApp is, I mean, unfortunately, from the point of view of social listening, fortunately, from the point of view as a user, uh, it is completely wall-to-wall -wall service. It, it is no way that you can get that data. It's encrypted. And um, so WhatsApp cannot be included on in any sort of social listening thing, and no, nobody has access to that data. And um, in terms of, as we've mentioned, Facebook and Instagram are the other two. It's just a case of if you have a campaign that's launching tomorrow, you can set them up in advance and, and do that. But if you're looking retrospectively, it's trickier. Instagram, there is actually some historical data there. So you can look at Instagram data from 2015 up until December 11th, 2018. Um, but obviously that's getting more and more outdated and the usage of Instagram is changing significantly as well since 2018. So it's becoming less relevant on that front. But as I said, you can set up a hashtag in advance and then track conversation that emerges around that hashtag. So unfortunately, we're at time. Um, we got a lot of really great questions and um, I, I just want to make sure that we get a chance to provide an answer. So before, um, before logging off, I just wanted to say that we are gonna have a, a further discussion on Springboard um, scheduled for October where we're gonna invite people to submit their questions and we will provide um, answers through a a kind of online discussion session and so we will share that invitation with all of the participants here so that we can continue answering these questions. I do want to make sure that we capture these questions and we are able to provide um, a, a written answer when we when we share the webinar since we were a little bit short on Q&A time. Um, so I think that's that's uh, that's my commitment in trying to to get a few answers to the questions that we weren't able to touch upon. Um, but again, I just wanted to thank everybody for your participation, and we will be um, uh, sharing sharing resources with you. Thank you very much, and thank you again to uh, my co-presenters.